Hey Palerinos, welcome back to Reformation Rambles, a series where I tell you all about the history of the European Reformation. Today is a video that has been requested more than any other. One at the Palace of Placentia in Greenwich, Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, 1491. The first supreme head of the Church of England and the father of the Royal Navy. Let's talk about Henry VIII. Part 1. Young Catholic Prince Henry was one of six or seven kids, depending on which book you read. And only three of them survived past infancy, which is above average for the time. These three were his older brother Arthur, himself, and his sister Margaret. So he was never expected to become king. His older brother was set to be heir, he survived infancy, he was probably going to be fine, you know? So because of that, he was never trained to be king. Like, at this time, people would prepare the presumed heir for kingly duties and Henry didn't get any of that because he wasn't going to be king. He helped organise his brother's marriage to Catherine of Aragon in 1502 and just 20 weeks later died. Probably of sleeping sickness but we don't know. He was only 15 at the time and suddenly 10 year old Henry was next in line for the throne. Now Henry was a classic like renaissance man. He introduced renaissance music to the royal court and he had people out, sorry for my cat walking everywhere, she won't let me put her claws. And he scouted choir boys the way people scout like celebrities now. I thought that was interesting. He sight read music and sing pretty well apparently, although it'd be quite a bold move to tell the king that he can't sing. So. <laughs> He also played organ and virginals, and I hate to break it to you, but he probably didn't write green sleeves. But he did write Pastime of Good Company. <laughs> he loved sports, especially jousting, hunting and real tennis. Later on he'd use sports as like a political device to show how powerful he was took part in regular jousting tournaments throughout his reign and even when it reached a point where he couldn't joust anymore he'd still host two events a year it was really something that he cared about a lot he was also a gambler and a dice player i want to build a full image because we all know some stuff about henry VIII, i think and beyond you know sort of beheading people i feel like we skip over everything else and he was a multifaceted human like we all are. Henry would be the first English king with a modern humanist education. He was fluent in English, French and Latin. He owned a large library. He also published one of his own books, which <laughs> wish I could do that. I wish. I love my book, but I'm very bad at pitching myself. When he was young, Henry was a well-informed but devout Catholic. So. Henry wanted to marry his brother's widow. Really need to make that incest alarm. In fact, let's do it now. So his dad, Henry, and Catherine's mum, Isabella of Castile, started sort of putting the pressure on to make this happen. I made a video about her mum just saying, she's a cool lady. Um, so pressure on the Pope was put on because technically the Bible didn't let you marry your brother's widow. Now obviously, the cat's not going to come. obviously at this time, Henry's 10, <laughs> he's not going to get married right now. So they had to wait. Obviously, obviously, not obviously, Catherine at the time reportedly felt it was God's will and she should marry Henry and that, that was God's plan for her. Definitely had nothing to do with how useful an Anglo-Spanish alliance was to both parties. <laughs> That's a less fun story. Henry came to the throne in 1509 when he was 17 years old. Remember being 17? Now imagine you're running a country, what the fuck? And literally, basically as soon as his dad was buried, body's barely cold, he declares he's going to marry Catherine. He said it was his dad's dying wish, which seems convenient. <laughs> Whilst in power, he was quite moderate with the rival House of York compared to like his dad who'd basically killed a lot of them. In case you didn't know, I'm from Lancaster, so Red Rose County represents. 
Most of you are from the UK, you don't have a fucking clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> but yeah, he pardoned a lot of people, like the Marquess of Dorset, for example. Also, two days into his reign, he killed two of his dad's advisors who had become quite unpopular within the court. These were Sir Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley. Because they were so unpopular, no one really protested and they were charged with high treason, set to be executed in 1510. Henry hadn't been on the throne a full year yet. Unlike a lot of my other videos, I'm going to jump around a bit chronologically to stick to certain themes because otherwise this is going to get confusing. And it's already going to be a long video and I kind of don't want to make it so horrifically long no one ever watches it. Henry's reign was complicated by a lot of factors. And I can't make this video under an hour if I want to stay chronological. <laughs> Part 2. Killer King. It's not a secret that Henry was beheady ready. He expanded royal power and used charges of treason. Heresy to sort of quell dissent to stop people rising up against him. He used bills of attainder to execute people with no trial. Essentially executed court nobles at will. In terms of high profile killings he would burn or behead two of his wives four leading public servants, six close attendants, one cardinal and multiple abbots. He had someone kill them, he didn't do it personally. That's, there were hundreds of people killed under his reign, these are just the ones who he had personal relationships with in some respects. His chief ministers would have a lot of power. Some historians actually think they sort of ran the country and Henry just took the credit and that they sort of made the changes that are associated with the era. That's not a fact. Um, we don't know because obviously Henry had to sign off on everything regardless. So <laughs> it's a very heated debate. Could make a whole video on that alone. Don't have time. We're powering through. We're not going to let this be over an hour. <laughs> Cardinal Wolsey advised the king from around 1514 until he was arrested in 1529. He oversaw domestic foreign policy. He centralised the English government. He extended the jurisdiction of consular courts. He also used the existing Star Chamber to form criminal law. However, when he didn't sort a divorce for Henry, things went downhill. And it wasn't hard to turn people against him. He had a lavish life. He was the poster boy for abuses of the church. He also tried to secretly negotiate with the King of France and the Holy Roman Emperor to get support when it became clear that Henry was turning against him. But ultimately, he was arrested in 1529 and would die awaiting trial in 1530. Another advisor, Thomas Cromwell, removed government tasks from the royal household and put them into the public state. Made the king's income streams more formalised, they weren't just sort of random bits of money coming in, and created the first real differentiation between the king's money and the country's money. Whereas up until then, they'd been one and the same, which is bad for. A whole host of reasons, I'm sure you can come up with a few in your own. Let me know in the comments if you want to. He'd be executed for treason in 1540. With a lot of power comes a lot of risk, especially in this time. Speaking of money, part three. Hey big spender. Henry's dad had been insanely frugal. Left a lot of money to Henry. It was about 375 million pounds in modern money when we translate it up, you know? And Henry was a chronic overspender. He almost made the country bankrupt multiple times throughout his reign. Spent a lot on stuff for his court and his household, including extending royal homes and palaces. Lancaster <coughs> <Guess the> Castle. <coughs> and he bought 2,000 tapestries for one palace. The country's in ruin, but at least there's fabric on the wall. He also had this like ridiculous weapons collection. It had like longbow stuff. All sorts. It included like 6,500 handguns. He'd spent his entire inheritance on war by the mid 1520s and regularly turned to Parliament for war grants so he could keep fighting all these places and build up like the start of an empire. To give you an idea of how expensive these wars were, one of his wars in France only lasted three months and cost around £850,000 in today's money literally buy a house in London. <laughs> Madness. It's kind of insane that he managed to almost bankrupt the country multiple times because his income went up a lot in this time. Well, there's the standard king's income from like crown lands and customs. Standard money that had previously gone to Rome was redirected to him when the church was switched. 
The dissolution of the monasteries made him about £36 million in today's money. But he blew it all on fancy shit and war, which takes us to... What for? Warmonger. Throughout his reign, Henry would have some level of war with France, the Holy Roman Empire, Scotland and Ireland. The situation in Ireland was confusion for me as a reader. Different books sort of opposed each other. I'm still not super clear on that. Kind of didn't have time to really get my teeth into it. If any scholars fancy explaining it in basic terms, email me or put it in the comments, tweet at me, whatever. I, I want to know, but I couldn't. My brain wasn't quite understanding. <laughs> but for want of trying, something just won't click in my head. So here's a whistle stop tour of where some of the war money went. He joined the anti French Holy League in 1511 with Spain. The Anglo Spanish forces attacked Aquitaine to try and reclaim it for England. Henry really wanted to conquer France. He felt like it was English land. He'd called himself King of France in like all official memos. In 1512, war was officially declared, but it was only really used to further Spanish aims, and the alliance would die a death. Before it did, France would lose all its Italian land. In 1513, Henry reinvaded France and won at the Battle of Spurs. This was a relatively minor victory, but it was spun up into some outstanding propaganda. Like, <laughs> textbook propaganda to convince the people of England that they were doing an amazing thing out there. It was really successful. People in England were like, fuck yeah, we're beating the French. And then we didn't stop for half a millennia. The majority of your audience is American Bob. Who's that joke for? So whilst Henry's off fighting the French, Scotland and it's free real estate and invaded England. And Henry's wife Catherine defended the country. Why did we never learn that? We learned he dumped her and like absolutely nothing else. She's her mother's daughter. Go watch the Isabella video. Fuck me. Soon the leaders of France, the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope would change and this created kind of a clean slate effect. A lot of these wars stopped for a while. This is when the field of the cloth of gold happened. I talked about it a lot in this video but essentially they spent a fortune just showing off to each other, England and France, for a while and didn't really get anything out of it. Rich people do stupid shit man. Henry would even offer to mediate the habsburg valois conflicts in 1521, but he still deep down wanted to restore English lands in France, even though he'd form an alliance with the French king, Francis I, and protect him from invasions within the Holy Roman, Holy Roman Empire. But around 1539, this alliance would turn sour, and there'd be another war. He actually formed a secret alliance with the Holy Roman Emperor, entered into the Italian wars. In 1542, he'd defeat the Scots in combat in preparation to invade France the next year. Didn't want a repeat of before. We're learning from our mistakes. That makes a change. But this defeat didn't last. It became an eight year war. <laughs> it would come to be known as the rough wooing, which I hate. <laughs> it's a really bad name for it. There's nothing romantic about it. It's like jamming Scotland into a union. Regardless, in 1544, the invasion of France went ahead. It's only a year late was a two-pronged attack. One group attacked Vale and another group attacked Boulogne. Boulogne fall three months later, around this time Charles, the Holy Roman Emperor, made peace with France, which left Henry alone in this sort of war he'd landed in, <laughs> which probably heavily influenced the Treaty of Comte in 1546, which would agree that Henry got Boulogne for eight years and then France would have to pay him to get it back they had to pay like the equivalent of £750,000, which was fortunate because the war had cost him about £650,000. <laughs> really needed that money, was almost bankrupt again. The Henry's rule, the base standing army was only a few hundred men. He executed Anne Boleyn, we'll get to it. There was a risk of both French and Spanish invasion. So in 1538, Henry built state-of-the-art defences across the south and southeast of England often referred to as from Kent to Cornwall. He used stuff he'd taken whilst dissolving the monasteries to reinforce his defences. He fortified like existing coastal forts. Um, so I think like River Castle was one of them. Invested in fancy cannons for their ships and set up England's first permanent navy. 
which is why people refer to him as the father of the Royal Navy. He also established the Council for Marine Causes, which over time would become the Admiralty. It's wrong to completely ignore Ireland in this section because shit was going down. I'm just bad at understanding it. So here's what I've gathered. Um, England thinks of Ireland as three sections at this time. There's actually more, but we're ignorant fucks. So <laughs> there's the pale where English rule is completely unchallenged. There's the bit run by Irish lords on behalf of England and, and like the king. It was like Leinster and Munster. And there were areas that were like nominally under English rule, but not really. It was like Connaught and Ulster. So Irish lords were allowed to rule in the English king's name. And the ways England tried to manage this varied hugely. There'd be like actual diplomacy and there'd be straight up invasion, um, full on military occupation. Eventually their reasoning for trying to like conquer Ireland, even though it was kind of part of England already, was that they were answering to the Pope. And no one was meant to be answering to the Pope anymore. They were meant to be part of the Church of England even though they, <laughs> it was such an arbitrary switch of religion. <laughs> That's all I'm sure on. Please, if you know anything, inform me in the comments. Uh, I struggled to make sense of the books I read. Part five, quickfire wives. I don't want to talk about wives in this video. I don't know about anywhere else, but here in the UK, you do it to death. Like. You learn it almost as much as you learn about World War II, and frankly I find a lot of it quite boring now. <laughs> but it also felt wrong to ignore because this is a big factor in his life and there are ways he subtly changes between wives. And they were quite cool ladies, most of them, and I didn't want to just shove them out the story because they mattered. So quick fire wives. So we know he was married to Catherine of Aragon, his brother's widow. They got married in 1510. She had a stillborn girl in 1511. She had a son, they called him Henry. They held a big joust to celebrate and he died seven weeks later. Had two more stillborn sons in 1513 and 15. And then in 1516, she had her daughter, Mary. And this really improved like a kind of strained relationship she had with the king. Side note, he had a lot of mistresses at the time. We'll get back to that. In 1518, Catherine had a stillborn girl again. In 1519, one of Henry's mistresses, Elizabeth Blount, a son, he was called Henry Fitzroy, in 1519. Henry made him the Duke of Richmond, and based on political acts he was trying to get through at the time, he was trying to make it so he could make him the heir, even though he was illegitimate. This wouldn't happen, we'll get back to that. Another of Henry's mistresses was Mary Boleyn, one of Catherine's ladies in waiting. By 1525, Henry's really stressed and frustrated. He doesn't have a son, he doesn't have, as far as he's concerned, an heir, because a woman can't run a country. Duh. He becomes enamoured with Mary's sister, Anne Boleyn. She was one of 25 people who made up the Queen's entourage. She refused to be his mistress. In 1527, Henry concluded he had no son because his marriage was blighted in the eyes of God because he had technically acted against Leviticus 2021 by marrying his brother's widow. He goes against the Pope, starts a new religion, we'll get to that in detail in a moment, and marries Anne Boleyn. She's really intelligent and educated, especially for a woman at the time. But her strong opinions made her a lot of enemies. Women were meant to be meek and mild in this time and anything other than that was seen as bad. Uh, she didn't like her. She refused to be this meek subordinate wife. And in 1524, she had a miscarriage. And Henry would see this not having a son for him as a personal betrayal. <laughs> like she can help it. But he's still having affairs this whole time. In 1536, Catherine died. By this point, Anne is pregnant again. They didn't fuck around. Henry went and jousted in a tournament. He was unhorsed and severely injured. And for a while, they thought the king was going to die. Unconscious for quite a while. And the stress and shock of this caused Anne to miscarry. Completely understandable, right? Apparently not to Henry, he turned on her. <laughs> Anne didn't have many allies. Like I said, she made a lot of enemies by being an outspoken woman. Even some members of her family didn't like how outspoken she was. Allegations of adultery and witchcraft begin to swirl. King moves his mistress, Jane Seymour, into Anne's rooms. Plans were pretty damn clear. She would be charged with adultery and incest. There was very little evidence, but she was found guilty anyway and sentenced to death. The day after Anne was executed, Henry got engaged to Jane Seymour. They got married 10 days later. 
<laughs> your wife has literally not been dead a fortnight. In 1537, Jane would have the son Henry wanted. With that, he abandoned trying to legitimise Henry Fitzroy, though he kept like his titles. He was still Duke of Richmond and everything. Twelve days later, Jane Seymour died of an infection after having complications from the birth. What a time to be a woman. Henry moved on really quickly. Like, people always say he was super in love with Jane. I think that was like a nostalgia thing later. Because he moves on like that. Cromwell, his advisor at the time, suggested the Duke of Cleves' sister, Anne of Cleves. Their religion fell somewhere between Catholicism and like Lutheranism, which was ideal because that was kind of where the Church of England lay. Uh, they got married and then very quickly got it annulled. They both said the marriage wasn't consummated, so it wasn't legitimate. And out of this divorce, Anne got two houses and a solid alliance. Um, well played, Anne. We respect the hustle. In 1540, on the day his advisor Cromwell was executed, Henry married Catherine Howard, who was the cousin and lady-in-waiting of his ex, Anne Boleyn. He awarded her Cromwell's lands and loads of jewellery. Now, it does look like she actually did have an affair with a man called Thomas Culpepper, and she did hire her ex-fiancé, Francis Derham, as her secretary, which provided suspicion that she cheated on Henry, possibly before they were married with this ex-fiancé of hers. There's certainly more evidence of adultery here than with Anne, okay? But Henry's been having affairs this whole time and that's okay. Double standards much. Thomas Cromwell would take evidence of the Derham affair to the king and Catherine was executed in 1542. Henry then married a wealthy widow called Catherine Parr in 1543. She was a reformer and she helped Henry fix his relationship with his daughters. So Henry had like wiped them off of the inheritance line. They were never going to come to power. He got them to put them... He got... He... Blah, blah, blah. She convinced him to change up succession back so that if anything happened to Edward they'd be next in line type thing and we've touched on it but this is Reformation Rambles so let's delve into part six changing the country's religion to fuck let's backtrack a bit to Henry's initial break with Rome like I think I've said um beforehand he actually embraced and supported papal supremacy and it's unclear when his opinion changed so he asked the Pope, Pope Clement VII, to annul his marriage to Catherine, because he argued the Pope should have never allowed it in the first place, it goes against God, right? The Pope says no. What is it Eugene Lee Young says? I'm right, you're wrong, shut up. Now before these problems, Pope Leo X had given Henry the title, the official title of Defender of the Faith, after he'd published a defence of the Seven Sacraments following like this slight rise of Protestantism in Europe. So 1521, this is a full on like flip of his own opinion, however you interpret it. Eventually the Pope would agree to an ecclesiastical court, but it was a foregone conclusion the papal legate in attendance was never gonna let Henry have his way. This was just after the sack of Rome as well, so the Pope is under the control of Charles V who is Henry's current wife's nephew. Is he gonna let him dump her and lose all the power? Unlikely. After just two months, the Pope called Henry's case back to Rome with no plans to ever reopen it and no plans to give him what he wanted. This was 1529, so Henry's attempts to appeal to the Pope are basically done at this point. Around this time, Henry banishes his wife Catherine from the royal court and moves Anne into her rooms. The eventual divorce would end a 24-year marriage. It wasn't a short-lived fling by any means. In 1532 he gained French support for his new marriage and after he got the support he came back from France and him and Anne had a secret marriage. And they'd have a big ceremony in 1533. It would be the same year Thomas Cranmer would officially nullify his wedding, his marriage to Catherine and Anne would have her daughter Elizabeth in the same year. And a Reformation Parliament was set up to sort out this king's sudden switcheroo of religions because it's really not as simple as just Sorted. Done now. There's a lot of things that need amending. 
1534, the king was proclaimed head of the Church of England, which was set up roughly from 1532 to 7, with a series of Acts of Parliament. The Statute and Restraint of Appeals was passed in 1533. People couldn't appeal to Rome about any issues they had, and papal bulls could no longer be enforced in England. Doing either of these now carried the death penalty. The Act of Succession was passed the same year, which meant all adults in England had to acknowledge that Henry was now married to Anne and that his previous marriage was not legitimate. Freedom of belief is a glorious thing, isn't it? Refusal to do this would lead to life in prison. In 1534, the Ecclesiastical Appointments Act was passed. This meant the clergy could only nominate bishops that the king suggested to them. So he had, he gave them a short list, essentially. The same year, the Act of Supremacy was passed, declaring the king the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England. And the Treasons Act was passed. If you refuse to take the oath of supremacy and declare that, yeah, Henry's the only king, of the, the only king, the only supreme head of the Church of England, and only the kings in this line will be, you'd commit high treason and you'd be executed. This time, Henry would frequently use parliamentary time to discuss questions around this new religion. He would produce the Act of Six Articles, which took six major questions about the orthodoxy of this new church. It's easy to assume <laughs> this all happened because he wanted to fuck Anne Boleyn. I think that's kind of what's implied to us when we're in school and we're learning about it as well. There's a lot of political power to be gained by rejecting the papacy. The Catholic Church at this time was the largest international political power in Europe. Before the Reformation, this essentially would was a foreign influence in their political affairs, and by breaking from the church, Henry got rid of that, and he had complete power over people, over their beliefs, over... This is a time when the church and people's lives are so intertwined that to put them all in the power of one person was for them to have ultimate control. This led to theology being built around obedience to the crown. In 1539, the Great Bible in English was completed. This is momentous, everything was in Latin before. Reformed liturgy and Book of Common Prayer would be finished in 1549, firmly establishing the theology of the new religion. Do not be mistaken, this is a way to merge church and state, and it was very effective. I'd also point, like to point out the English Reformation had far less progressive undertones than most Protestant reform in Europe. A lot of the movements in Europe focused on how the church was too powerful, and corrupt, and taking advantage of regular people, and it made moves to rectify that. Whereas in England, it was a king getting more power. Which may be why Protestants who weren't Church of England were often still persecuted in England. An example being William Tyndall. He was a Lollard, he was sentenced to death by burning for heresy in 1536. Eventually, the, someone would intervene and he would be strangled to death before his body was lit on fire for everyone to see. So, small mercies. Ironically, his work would form the basis of the English Bible. Where is the consistency? In 1534, the campaign against idolatry really got going. In 1535, Cromwell would complete the Valor Ecclesiasticus, which worked out the taxable value of all church possessions. And not long after, really strict behavioural standards were applied to monasteries to sort of encourage them to dissolve themselves. Dissenting monks of the new religion were executed as early as 1534. In 1536, the Dissolution of the Lesser Monasteries Act was passed, which closed down a lot of smaller monasteries, and all their property just went to the crown. Now, these houses were one of the only places that offered support to the impoverished, especially outside of London. This loss of help and support angered and charity angered a lot of people, ultimately led to the Pilgrimage of Grace. In the north of England from 1536 to 7, it was led by Robert Ask, essentially working class people who were angry that the monasteries were being dissolved. He actually originally offered to pardon them and thank them for raising the issues with him, but when unrest didn't die down, these uprisings were rapidly shut down and around 200 people were executed. It wasn't long before larger monasteries and convents were also shut down, dissolved, and all their money went to the crown. This movement against religious idolatry 
would ultimately lead to, ultimately lead to a shrine for St Thomas Becket in Canterbury being dismantled. Henry was officially excommunicated in 1538 and this movement was ramped up. In 1540, he sanctioned the complete destruction of shrines to saints. In 1542, the last monasteries were dissolved and all their property went to the crown. This was when all the abbots and priests would lose their seats in the House of Lords. And this really secured the position of this new religion through violence, I guess. 800 houses were dissolved. It made the crown about £90,000 a year. I don't know what that would be in today's money. I couldn't find that number. Part 7. Ill health and succession. Henry was plagued by health problems towards the end of his life. In 1524 he was jousting and didn't pull his visor down all the way so he got hit like above his eye and he had severe migraines from then on. In 1530 he got malaria which would recur throughout his life. But most significantly in 1536 he was thrown off his horse whilst jousting. He possibly got a head injury some people think it may have caused some form of brain damage. This was when Anne Boleyn miscarried because she thought he was going to die. The reason people think this may have caused a brain injury is there's this shift around this time from this young, athletic, helpful person to a sort of tyrannical leader that we see Henry VIII has now. It definitely gave him a chronic leg wound for the rest of his life. It would eventually lead to him putting on weight, being moved about by mechanical like pulley systems. He would be covered in boils and he would develop gout. It seems quite likely he died of scurvy in 1547. Kings didn't eat vegetables, they were for poor people. <laughs> he was entombed besides his third wife, Jane Seymour, succeeded by his nine-year-old son. He was so young, Henry had included a bit in his will about um, the executors who who would run the country on his behalf until he was 18. I think there were like 16 of them. And that's the story of Henry VIII. And his life's essentially become mythical. There were a lot of misconceptions, but this quote summarises how he was viewed in his own time. One of the most charismatic rulers to sit on the English throne. I really hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give me a cheeky like and subscribe. If I touched on anything or anyone you'd like to hear more about, let me know in the comments. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Frankie, please, I'm filming. Please! Who'd have cats? Please! Gizmo, I'm trying to film. He said it was his... expanded royal power. PLEASE!